And I'm now going to turn it over to Carly and Billy. All right. You gotta unmute. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, hooray. <laughs> All right, terrific. Um, what I said, what you missed was hello and welcome officially um, to this talk. It's so wonderful to see all of you. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Carly Rossman Sadisky. My husband Seth and I live in Hopewell with our three kids, and we have been very proud to be part of this community for the past two years. And I'm just so um, grateful to be here with you guys today for this very important presentation and conversation. Um, today, individually and as a Jewish community, many of us are engaged in the work of opposing racism in all of its forms and advancing racial justice. And as with so many things, understanding the past can help us uh, help to ensure our success in that in the future. Or to paraphrase James Baldwin, uh, to prevent us from becoming trapped in a history which we do not understand. Mm. So tonight we are going to explore some of the lessons of that past, specifically looking at the complex relationship between Jewish and Black communities during the civil rights era, understanding the historical events that shaped Jewish activism and participation, or the lack thereof, in that movement on both sides, and to understand how that complicated history reverberates today. Mm -hmm. We are very fortunate to be led tonight by um, our guest, presenter, and guide, Billy Edgar, who has worked in Jewish experiential education for more than 35 years. Billy is the founder and director of Edgar 36, a summer, a summer journey that takes Jewish teens on a bus across America to learn history, politics, and activism, to find their voice and to find their power by meeting with people on all sides of political issues, and to create change and develop their American and their Jewish identity. If you are interested in learning more about Billy and Edgar 36, I will place the link to his website in the chat. Thank you. Um, and speaking of the chat, no problem, of course. Um, our plan for the evening, speaking of the chat, will be um, as follows. So Billy is going to start us off with a presentation that should run for about 30 minutes. Um, we're going to use the chat primarily for the Q&A. That's the plan. So if you, as questions come up during the presentation, please put them in the chat while they're fresh, and we can pick them up at, at, at times throughout the, throughout the talk. Um, and at the end of the sort of formal presentation, we'll turn it over to, to Q&A fully. Um, if you would prefer, there are, I think there are, we have, an, we were going to use the chat primarily. If you're having trouble with the chat, you can use the raise hand feature and we can try to individually, um, you can voice a question, but let's try to use the chat primarily. I think that would be the easiest. Um, before I turn things over to Billy, um, just one final note. You know, talking about race can be challenging, especially when the conversation forces us to uh, confront our own self-perceptions and beliefs. Uh, I'm very proud to be a part of a community that is accepting that challenge and engaging in that work. Uh, and to frame and guide and inspire our conversation tonight, I would like to share an opening intention by the Justice Doula, Nikki Scott Bay Jones, with thanks to Rabbi Adina uh, Blum for suggesting it. And here it is. Together we will create brave space because there is no such thing as safe space. We exist in the real world. We all carry scars and we have all caused wounds. In this space, we seek to turn down the volume of the outside world. We amplify voices that fight to be heard elsewhere. We call each other to more truth and love. We have the right to start somewhere and continue to grow. We have the responsibility to examine what we think we know. We will not be perfect. This space will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be but it will be our brave space together and we will work on it side by side. And with that message in our hearts, I turn this over to Billy. Thank you and amen to that. Uh, that was a beautiful way to start out here. And it's great to see everybody. I, I told my mom that I was speaking to a group from Princeton and she was so happy that uh, to associate the word Princeton and me in the same sentence there. Um, so, uh, I wanna start off also by just making a statement because I know I'm 53 years old and I grew up here in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a native of Atlanta and that's where I am right now. And growing up when I did, 
when you mentioned Jewish people, you pretty much thought white people. You pretty much assumed that. And today, that is, uh, and I'm really happy to say, not true. And nor should we uh, think that way. Jews of color are finding voices in our communities, and we need to find more spaces for their voices. But I do just want to say, when, when I am doing this talk, I am referring, when I say the Jewish community or Jews, I am referring to white Jews at this point, because a lot of this is going to be based in the 50s and 60s, uh, when we thought of the Jewish community more monolithically. Um, so for, I just want to clarify that. Um, and secondly, is I often think of a telegram that one of the bigger names uh, from our community that was involved in the civil rights movement, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, wrote to President Kennedy in the early 60s, where he wrote to President Kennedy and said that we need to take care of, to use the vernacular of the time, which he wrote in, the Negro problem in America. And he called for, a, that President Kennedy should call for a Marshall Plan to aid the black community. And then he ended by saying the time calls for moral grandeur and spiritual audacity. And it's not often, I think, that we understand that we are in a time of revolution and a time that calls for moral grandeur and spiritual audacity. And I think in 2020, we are in that time right now. And so it is so great that you guys are gathered, that we are gathering together to have this talk. And it's important to talk on many fronts. Uh, I'm often asked, well, you're talking to other similar people. Everybody here pretty much looks the same. And I'm like, yes, there are spaces, there are multiple spaces to have these conversations. And I don't want to say at all that we shouldn't be out having talks with other people. Um, we should, but we also have to have a talk together to go out there so that we can have a frame of reference and an understanding. Because we Jews like to tell the story that we were heavily involved in the civil rights movement. The reality is yes, and the reality is no. There are four living Jews in Selma, Alabama today. The youngest is 66 years old. And as he's told me, he says, uh, there were Jews on both sides of the Edmund Pettus Bridge on Bloody Sunday. And I've been using that analogy quite a lot is how did we end up on both sides of that bridge? Because our narrative has been that we were on one side of the bridge. And so tonight we're gonna talk about why Jews found themselves on both sides of the bridge, how we ended up on both sides, because if we're gonna go out into the bigger world to have these important and necessary conversations, we need to be coming from a place of reality, not of midrash, not of uh, nice stories that make us feel good only about ourselves. There's a lot for us to feel good about, and there's a lot for us to reckon with when, when, when dealing with the civil rights movement. And so two overall tension points happen in the Jewish community when dealing with America. And that is, the first question is, are we white or are we Jewish? You know, are we considered white or are we considered Jewish? And oftentimes it changes. It changes from our point of view, but also how people view us. And also the age old dilemma all the way back from Fiddler on the Roof times, how much do we blend in? You know, how much do we assimilate? How good is it to assimilate versus how much are we giving up here? And so I wanna go back to understanding how did Jews end up in the South? And every time I talk to a group somewhat connected to New York City, I realized that this isn't heard well. And I had a temple from New York Upper East Side push back on me on this when I'm like, this is fact. There was a time before Ellis Island. There were other ways that people came into America before Ellis Island. And, and to them, it was mind blowing. But Savannah and Charleston were the Manhattan of, the, of, the, of America at the time, because that was the main entree point was, was through there. And that's how Jews ended up in the South. And now I'm going to do something that's going to blow the minds of all the young people who've worked with me. That is, I'm, I'm going to su successfully share some pictures with you on a technical format. Okay, okay. Do you see a picture? No, whoops, I got to start the uh, slideshow. Okay. All right, do you see a picture, uh, a big picture right now? Okay, great. All right, then we're good. That's about as good as it's gonna get is tonight. 
Um, so I want to start with there were two major waves of Jewish immigration into the South. And in particular, when you talk about the South, um, you know, people talk about Manhattan, everything roams around Manhattan. In the South, everything roams around Atlanta as the big city. So the two major waves of immigration to Atlanta uh, and the Southern area, and we're talking about the late 1800s, mid to late, late 1800s, were the first wave were your German Jews. And these were your classic reformed Jews. They wanted to do nothing but blend. And if you've seen the movie Driving Miss Daisy, uh, this is that. They would have Christmas trees in their uh, house. Their services would be on Sunday morning. They wanted to do nothing but blend. They happened to be Jewish, but more important to them, they were Southern. And then you had the second wave, which was your Eastern European Jews. And they stood out. They prayed differently. They looked differently. They ate differently, kept kosher. And they embarrassed the German Jews because they stood out. And in the South, even to today, when you are not of the WASP upbringing, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant upbringing, you try not to stand out. I was always brought up, just don't stand out here. Let's just be. Um, and so this gentleman, Leo Frank, was a New York Jew of German descent who moved down to Atlanta into the white power establishment. If you were from New York, you were Jewish. If you're Jewish, you're from New York. They didn't like you for either one of these things. And so he moves down and marries into a prominent uh, Atlanta Jewish family, the Selig family, still today a prominent Jewish family in Atlanta. And they own uh, numerous businesses. And one of them was a pencil factory. And Leo Frank managed the pencil factory. And so now we're in 1913. And on a Saturday afternoon, a 13-year-old girl named Mary Fagan, who lives in Cobb County, Marietta, Georgia, which is right above the city of Atlanta, she comes to collect her pay. She works in the pencil factory. Now she wants her money because she's going to go downtown uh, just a couple blocks from the pencil factory to a parade to, that honors our Confederate dead. And this is why the play about this story is called Parade. And so she goes to collect her money and her body is found in the coal shaft of the pencil factory murdered. Now, 1913 Atlanta, the first person they suspect of the murder is exactly who you would think, a black man named Jim Conley. Jim Conley was a custodian in the pencil factory, but there was reasons why they suspected him beyond just that he's black. That is that when they found him, his shirt had blood on it and there was a murder note right by the body, left by the body. And when they read the murder note to Jim Conley, when he wrote it back out, when they were dictating it to him, same spelling mistakes and same handwriting. But this is not that racism is ever, or anti-Semitism is ever sane, but this is when it takes a crazy turn because our state general attorney, his name is Hugh Dorsey. And Hugh Dorsey looks at Jim Conley and says, I don't think you're telling the truth because you as a black man are not smart enough to have pulled off this murder. I need to know who did it. Jim Conley changes the story a little bit, but still has him as the guilty ver person. And Hugh Dorsey's like, it's not the right story. You, I want to know the truth. What's the truth? Finally, he comes up with a story that says that he was walking by the coal shaft and his boss, Leo Frank, pulls him into the coal shaft and says, help me get rid of this body. I murdered this girl here. And that's why the blood was on his shirt. And Leo Frank made Jim Conley write out the murder note. And that's why it was in his handwriting with the spelling mistakes. And Hugh Dorsey says, that's a story I can go with. So they go to Leo Frank's house late at night with the sheriff. And Leo Frank says something that we would probably all say. He said to the sheriff, I wanna to talk to my lawyer first. Well, in 1913 Atlanta, that is getting a little uppity there. <clears throat> so they arrest Leo Frank. And he is tried for the murder of Mary Fagan. Now, this is in the summer of 1913. No air conditioning. People are able to stick their heads in the courtroom windows because they are open into the downtown and yell out, the Jew did it, kill the Jew. And in fact, the judge walks in on the first day of the trial with a sensationalist newspaper 
with bold red headlines on it. It says the police have the strangler with a picture of Leo Frank. And the judge is reading this newspaper with the headlines facing the jury as they walk in for the first day of the trial. Not shocking, uh, Leo Frank is found guilty and sentenced to death for the murder of Mary Fagan. Now, this is where a hero steps into the story. Our then governor, John Slayton, at the end of his governorship, he says, I have been studying the case of Leo Frank and the trial. And I have to say, I don't know whether Leo Frank is innocent or guilty, but what I do know is this trial was not fair. So on his last day of being governor, he commuted the sentence from death to life in prison, went home and packed his bags and left the state of Georgia for 20 years because the locals were going crazy. They were angry with him. They started hanging him in effigy, uh, making dummies of him and hanging him. And this sign at the bottom of this effigy is blown up here. And it says, John Slayton, King of the Jews here. So at this point, anti-Semitism is sweeping the nation as well. And two organizations are created in connection to the story. In Chicago, there are some uh, Jewish lawyers who get together and they create in connection to this trial and the anti-Semitism, they create the Anti-Defamation League, the ADL. The other organization that's created right at the same time or really resurrected at the same time is in Atlanta, we have a large piece of exposed granite that people climb up to the top of the mountain. There's laser shows on it and it is called Stone Mountain. And some men from Marietta, Georgia, where Mary Fagan is from, go to the top of Stone Mountain and they put a cross in the ground and light it on fire and they resurrect the Ku Klux Klan, the KKK. It had been pretty dormant at the time. They call themselves the Knights of Mary Fagan and they want to exact revenge. So they go to the jail where Leo Frank is kept and they tell the jailer, we want Leo Frank. Now, this is not an uncommon story of a jailer giving into mob mentality, mob rule, and they, he hands Leo Frank over to these men. This is 1915. They put him in the back of the car and their goal is to make it all the way to Marietta to exact revenge for uh, Mary Fagan's death. The problem being is two things happen. One is the sun starts to come up. And back then the Klan, as opposed to now where they are much more visible and open, they don't like to do anything in the open. They want to be very secretive. So the sun's starting to come up. They know they have to act quick. But also the driver realizes that Leo Frank is professing his innocence to the driver's friends in the back of the car. And they're starting to believe him. So he quickly pulls off to the side of the road and um, into a farm where he knows the farmer. And he says, I have Leo Frank in, this, in the car. The farmer said, do what you want to do. They take Leo Frank out of the car and they ask him, do you have any wishes? And he takes off his wedding ring and he hands it to them. And he says, can you please get this to my wife? We sent her to New York during the trial because it was dangerous down here. They being upstanding good Southern gentlemen, they do that. And I'm being sarcastic here because a few minutes later, it's amazing they do that because a couple minutes later, they lynch Leo Frank, hang him. There are 400 documented lynchings around this time in Georgia. 399 are black. You have one white lynching right here, and it's Leo Frank. Now, I do want to point out, too, all the people who are in this picture, proudly showing up in this picture. This is not uncommon. People would take pictures. These were social events. No shame at all to being there. And they would make postcards of these and send them around to friends and all around the country to say, look at where I was. Also, they, they took down the body. They started ripping his clothes off and selling that and pieces of the rope to people. This sent shockwaves through the Southern Jewish community because all of a sudden they realize we don't blend. Fast forward to the 50s. We have a major reform temple in downtown Atlanta. The naming committee is not that original. It is called the temple. And they had a rabbi, Rabbi Rothschild, who was outspoken for civil rights. And if you've seen Driving Miss Daisy, you know this. The temple then was bombed. And the temple... Um, on a Saturday morning, nobody was killed here, but the rabbi's wife calls this the bomb that healed because the community showed up. 
This is the rabbi with the mayor of Atlanta, Mayor Hartsfield. If you ever flown into Atlanta, you are flying into Hartsfield Jackson Airport. Hartsfield was the first mayor to build the airport in Atlanta that really created Atlanta. The regular newspaper, the Atlanta Journal Constitution, wrote scathing editorials against the bombers. And I point that out, how wonderful it is that the community showed up so much that the wife called it the bomb that healed, but there were black churches being bombed all the time in silence at this moment. So you're gonna hear this theme over and over. If we want people to show up for us, we must show up for them when they need us as well, or when they are hurting. And so that is the temple bombing. And once again, the temple bombing really brings up, brings us to um, realize the Southern Jewish community that we do not completely blend here. Just because the color of our skin, we are given about a five minute head start on the black community. We are just one rung above the black community on the totem pole of hate here because our skin color buys us some time. We're gonna get back to the pictures in a second, but that brings us up to the post-World War II era. And what's happening is in the Jewish community in America is many of the parents at this time are first generation Americans. They come over and this time they are coming through Ellis Island at this point, and they are getting shtetlized in America basically, just surrounded by other Jews because many of them are living with family, with friends so that they get jobs, people vouch for them but they're also trying to blend into greater American society, but they're also just stuck in with the Jewish community. But then as America hits a post-World War II economic boom, so does the Jewish community. And we do what the white community does. We leave the inner city, white flight, Jewish white flight too. You have Levittown, New York, one of the first planned communities. Uh, sub suburbs in America, and we leave the inner cities. And all of a sudden, because we are successful too, we're white. Not so much Jewish anymore. We are now more considered white as well. And the kids of these parents, the baby boom generation, the best educated, the largest, the ones that could look a little deeper at things are seeing their parents' pursuit of this nice, pleasant life and realize while they are comfortable being white, they want to ex escape this Jewish identity, as any kids are prone to do, escape who they are. And they also want to engage in that which they think is a little dangerous, which is cool, which is really hip, which is Black culture at this time. And we're talking mostly about music, jazz, blues, or in the late 50s, if you're getting turned on to a nice little boy from Memphis, Tennessee, Elvis Presley, you can turn on to rock and roll. One of the things you're realizing if you are really into rock and roll is that Elvis did nothing original. All Elvis did was cover black muses, musicians. Half the black music community loves Elvis because he took their music to the masses. Half very angry, hate Elvis because he stole their music. But think about this for a second. In 1955, late 50s, if you are a white kid, white teenager, and you were being taught that the black teenager is the other, the less than, the somebody not to be dealt with, and you are listening to this music, and you're getting turned on to it, and you want to check out Ella Fitzgerald, you want to check out Louis Armstrong, John Coltrane, you want to check out Little Richard, Chuck Berry, all of the influences here, you've got to go back into the inner city. So if you're out in Levittown, you got to go back into New York City, maybe Colony Music over in Times Square. And, and check out these albums. And when we're dealing with teenagers, we got to tell them what a record store is. But you go to the record store and you are listening to an album and you look across and there's a black teenager listening to the same album you are. All of a sudden, the other becomes another, another teenager who's listening to the same music you are. All of a sudden, you can talk about the fact that, hey, we love this music which means our parents hate this music, which makes you love it even more. And you can share that. And all of a sudden, the, uh, the other becomes another, and there's a connection there. That's what culture was doing in pop culture. Very important about breaking down the barriers here. 
And so you can't underestimate the Jewish teenagers who are comfortable in their comfort do what all teenagers do who become comfortable in their comfort. They rebel against it and want to try and push back and do the exotic thing that their parents hate, which right now is befriending the black community at this point. The scary thing, not so much that their parents hate it, but the American Jewish tension of the moment is of being allowed in because of our white skin, but always wanting to tell the, the ultimate American story about how we pull yourself up by your bootstraps. So we want to tell that story, but we're also not acknowledging at the time that our skin helps us pull ourselves up because the black community is saying we can't even pull ourselves up from our bootstraps because we can't even afford the boots. We're not, we, can't, we don't even have boots to pull up. The other saying is this of the Jewish community at the time, universalism is the particularism of American Jews. Meaning what is very specific about American Jews is that we look globally. We look universally at what's going on because we have been kicked out of countries. It's in our DNA to try and fit in, to try and work our way into a society and to take care of people because we, as it's, as the line streetcar name desire is, has said, Blanche Dubois has said, we've been dependent upon the kindness of strangers in other countries to who have acted out of kindness to us. And so we are paying it forward here. And so universalism is the particularism of American Jews. And that is what brings us into the 60s. And as I said at the beginning, you had Jews on both sides of the civil rights battle, on both sides of the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And I get asked all the time, um, in the nice introduction, the lovely introduction, I talked about my summer trip, but during the school year, the academic year, when there's not a virus, we run about 50 to 55 of two and three day civil rights trips in the Southeast. Over half our business is now adult groups. And the adult groups come on the trip asking, why is the black and Jewish community not as together as we were in the 60s? And the reality is we were not so together in the 60s. Um, and so we're gonna explore now, why are Jews on both sides of the M.M. Pettus Bridge? And I wanna start on the white power establishment side, the anti-civil rights movement side. And one of the things to think about is this, it all goes back to the fifth grade recess yard. Think about it for a second. If there is a bully on the recess yard, I get that it would be great to answer that we would all get involved to take the bully down, to dismiss the bully, to stand up to the bully. But th let's be realistic for a second. Really, the two major ways that are going to happen with a bully is one, you're going to stay quiet and hope the bully never sees you to pick on you. Or number two, you may join the bully, so hoping that the bully doesn't turn on you while picking on other people. And that's what happened in the South with a number of Jews. But there is a reason why this is starting to happen. So sociologically what's happening is some of these people's parents, like I said, were first generation Americans. They escape Nazi Europe and come over and feel that America is the greatest thing ever. It is the golden Medina they talk about. And they are offended by the fact that people think America needs to change, that a group of people would call America out and want it to change. And this becomes specific in Selma, Alabama. Now, Selma, Alabama, and we're gonna go back to pictures for a second. Um, do you see pictures now or do I need to go back to screen share? You do? Somebody just go yes or no. Okay, hold on, let me get this right. All righty, all righty, all right, and okay, y'all see the pictures now? Okay, great. So uh, Selma, Alabama, the reason Selma happens in civil rights era is the work was already being done in Selma. The movement was already there because there was a sheriff named Jim Clark, this man with the hat on. We hear often about Bull Connor in Birmingham. Bull Connor, just as I jokingly will say, had a better PR agent. 
he, but Bull Connor would get on the nightly news. Jim Clark was equally brutal. He was the sheriff in Selma. He was keeping blacks from registering to vote, violently keeping them from voting, and also upholding white supremacy in, in Selma. So the movement was already there to oppose Jim Clark, led by two women, Amelia Boynton Robinson and Marie Foster. They were the ones who were organizing the voting registration in Dallas County, which is Selma. Now, after a mass meeting, this young man named Jimmy Lee Jackson comes out of the mass meeting and he sees his 82-year-old grandfather and grandmother about to be beaten by a police officer. The police officer pulled up his billy club and Jimmy Lee Jackson grabs the arm of the police officer. Something that should not happen if you're black in 1965 because he gets shot and he dies eight days later. And the movement decides, Amelia Boynton Robinson and Marie Foster decide that they are going to march from Selma to Montgomery, 53 miles, for a voting rights bill in Jimmy Lee Jackson's memory. And their original idea was to carry his body the 53 miles, but they decided not to. Now, Amelia Boynton, this is 1965. Two women cannot be the front of this movement at the time. They have to be working behind the scenes. So that means that the students come up to the front, two male students. One is con recently deceased uh, Congressman John Lewis. He was my congressman. Uh, and Reverend Hosea Williams. They are 21 years old and they are the leaders of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. Now they are organizing the march and Dr. King tells them not to do it. Now, what happens when the old man tells 21-year-old college students not to do something? They're going to do it. I would like to remind you that Dr. King, the old man, was all of 35 at the time. But Dr. King had said no for a reason. One was personal. Dr. King couldn't be there for the first march. But also, Dr. King knew they didn't have a permit. And so if they cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and if you ever come down uh, on this trip, you will see that there is nothing between Montgomery and Selma. There was nothing then, there's nothing now. He knew that if they made it past the bridge and into that backwoods area, they could be murdered and their bodies would never be found. But John Lewis and Hosea Williams being 21 years old are gonna force the issue. And of course, they come across the bridge on what is then gonna be called Bloody Sunday. They confront the state troopers and get beaten. This beating, the footage of the beating goes nationwide. It is sent out and shown on TV. They interrupt the movie of the week to show this. Nice trivia question here. The movie of the week that they interrupt is Judgment at Nuremberg. And so they break into that movie to show the footage. And this minister in Boston, James Reeb, white minister over here, he sees the footage and is so outraged by it, he immediately packs his bags and goes to the Boston airport and flies down towards Selma. He actually beats uh, uh, Dr. King to Selma. Dr. King gets there on Monday and James Reeb, a Universalist Unitarian minister, participates in the next march called Turnaround Tuesday. They walk across the bridge kneel down and pray in front of the state troopers, and then turn around and go back to the church. Because Dr. King said, one of the powerful things about America is the right to protest for your rights. Let's get a permit and let's march peacefully and protected by the state troopers. And so James Reeb is walking around the next day. He goes to an integrated diner with a couple other ministers. And when they walk out of the diner, their goal is to make it back to Brown's Chapel Church, the main meeting spot of the movement. What he didn't understand was being comfortable in his white skin, he didn't understand the lay of the land. So he took the short route, which is something I would have done, except that took him in front of a Klan diner. And these three men in the picture, members of the Klan, come outside and start beating the ministers. And James Reeb gets hit in the back of the head. Now, if you know concussions, as it's been explained to me, you're actually okay at the beginning. You can function normally at the beginning. And so he's walking around talking to people, but he's definitely been injured. And they can't take him to a white hospital 
in Selma because he's working on behalf of the civil rights movement. So they have to take him in an ambulance because they need to get him to a neurosurgeon. They put him in an ambulance and get him to Birmingham, which is an hour and a half away. He eventually dies in Birmingham. Now, uh, this is introduces a young man, a young Jewish man to the story named Saul Tepper. Now, Saul Tepper, his father escapes Nazi Austria. And Saul Tepper is around the dinner table hearing all the time about how great America is and how wrong it is that people are saying that we need to be different. In fact, when you go into Selma today, when you come across the Edmund Pettus Bridge into downtown Selma, there's a big building that says Tepper's across the top of it. They own department stores along the main street. So Saul Tepper grows up and believes that America does not need to change. These radicals in the civil rights movement are wrong. And so when James Reeb dies in Birmingham, Saul Tepper, who is the sheriff's right-hand man, he is Sheriff Jim Clark's right-hand man, Jewish man is his right-hand man, creates a narrative that they are going to use in the trial of these three men to be found innocent. And that is that the movement killed James Reeb in the back of the ambulance because they all saw James Reeb walking around and talking before they put him in the ambulance. And he creates the narrative that the movement, the civil rights movement, needed a martyr, a white martyr, to outrage the North and the white North. So they killed James Reeb. And it's a way that the white power establishment can tell a story about themselves that absolves themselves of the murder and this treatment. And by the way, it works in the trial. These men are found innocent of the murder of James Reeb. So also, you can't underestimate when, um, and this is bloody pictures of Bloody Sunday happening here. Um, you can't underestimate that during the civil rights era and in the 60s, many of the slum lords in the inner city were Jewish people. Many of the store owners along Main Streets were Jewish store owners, many who mistreated the black community when they came into the stores. Now, I will say many of the Jewish store owners were also some of the people who were the first people to hire black people. And so there was an upside to our owning the stores as well. But there was definitely, and a lot of them would use their business power to create the change and integrate the stores. So now we're going to shift to why were Jews on the civil rights side of the bridge? Because there are studies that say of the white people who came down from the north, the northern agitators, as we southerners would call you, something like 60% were Jewish. But not all of them would claim to have done it out of their Judaism. Now, these young people coming in are on the cusp of the counterculture. And so they are rejecting their parents' material wealth and their pursuit of a nice, pleasant American dream lifestyle because they realize not everybody has equal access to this. Not everybody is counted in the American dream. And so, and they're rejecting the wealth. And so they are reacting in that quote that I told you about the Jewish community, that, that many of the Jews are acting as universalists and would call themselves universalists at the time because they didn't just claim to do this out of their Judaism. They figured if we take care of racism, if we take care of, back then it wasn't as well known, but homophobia, we will also take care of anti-Semitism under the umbrella of universalism. They are comfortable criticizing America. And two of the major players that we've heard of from our side is Andrew Goodman and Mickey Schwerner. They were New York Jewish kids, though neither one would claim to be Jewish or take it, be doing this out of their Judaism. Their parents were very Jewish. Um, they came down in Freedom Summer, 1964, to Mississippi, to Philadelphia, Mississippi, and they were going to register Black people to vote. And they, in June of 1964, were with a local Black man, James Cheney. They were investigating a church that had been firebombed for hosting meetings about voter registration. And on the way back home from uh, investigating the church bo uh, bombing, their car was pulled over by the Klan, and they disappear. This missing sign goes across America. 
And all of a sudden, the white North, the white Jewish North, can see themselves in this struggle because these are their boys right here. Their bodies are found murdered a few weeks later. And this sends shockwaves through the Jewish community there. And later on, we will see other leaders of the counterculture, Allen Ginsberg, a Jewish poet, who also would claim to be more of a Buddhist, more of a universalist. He changes the way we read and write poetry uh, with his, with his uh, poem, Howl. And he, um, he and Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin, who are all major players in the civil rights movement, I mean, in the counterculture, all Jewish, but also would not have so much claimed their Judaism there either. But this is how you get to both sides of the bridge here and what's going on here. And before, at this point, it's a, how do we get to claiming Judaism in the counterculture and the civil rights movement? The Black Power Movement comes up. And the Black Power Movement starts what is known as uh, identity politics. In that the Black Power Movement is a back to Africa movement, a Black is Beautiful movement. And all of a sudden, everybody else who is taking their cues from the Black community, much like what's happening in the streets of America today, all of a sudden are saying, well, if they're playing identity politics, we must be able to, or it's okay for us. It coincides with the Jewish students and Jewish young people and Jewish activists, the 67 war, the six day war in Israel and also the beginnings of the free Soviet Jewry movement. So all of a sudden, it became popular to become Zionists here and to express your Judaism through Zionism as well and your activism through Zionism here. And so that's really the civil rights era. And before we jump to modern times, um, let me see if there's any questions here. And Laurie and Rich, I see your question here. So I'll just run Okay, I'm going to save that because that's going to be more of a modern question as of yesterday. Um, so uh, let me just get to the modern things. Unless people have any questions about the historical part, you can raise your hand, whatever you want to do. Um, if it's going to take too long to, or should we just move on? Any questions from the historical part? This modern part will bring up the questions and comments. And and as they said in the introduction, I've been working with teenagers for a while, so I'm very used to being disagreed with and um, talked back to. So feel free to do that. But modern Let's times, totally and, what? Yeah, okay. Modern times is, is this. Like the civil rights movement, what's happening in the streets right now, the protests in the streets, it's not our story. We are participants in somebody else's story. The civil rights movement is not our story. We were participants. We like to claim the story, but it's not our story. We were participants in this story. And we are participants now in the story that's what's happening on the streets. And what I, what I the point I wanna make about what's going on in the streets is a point I made earlier. If we wanna know where the world was in the 30s in Europe, or after the shootings in Pittsburgh, or the shootings in San Diego at the synagogues, then we must ask ourselves, where are we when it's people who don't look like us, who don't pray like us, who don't love like us? So where are we after the Pulse shooting in Orlando, or after the Charleston shootings at the Black Church, or after mosque shootings? I, I, I'm proud to say I think we are showing up more and more. But it can't just be about us when it's about us. Hate does not discriminate. If it's not us right now, it's going to be anti-Semitism at some point. And so the question is, all the more powerful to deal with it when it's in somebody else's backyard before it gets to our backyard. Not because, you know, just out of selfish manner, but because if we take care of somebody else's issues, we will help ourselves out too. And now I want to get to the big one, the big question or big comments all the time. And that is the Black Lives Matter uh, as uh, verse, you know, not verse, but Black Lives Matter with Israel and, and Judaism. So uh, as an anti-Zionist or anti-Semitic organization. <clears throat> and the, once again, these are only my points and you are more than welcome. In fact, it would be more interesting 
to please state yours if they don't line up with me. Um, I think that there is a difference and you can separate out the organization of Black Lives Matter with what is happening in the streets in that I'm not sure people protesting in the streets are all understanding what Black Lives Matter are or are part of it or even understand that there are these parts of the platform of Black Lives Matter. But my, my thought is even if all the black protesters in the streets right now are lined up with that and believe in the platform, even if I would say our place is to be there. Because if, in my opinion, if you wanna fight anti-Semitism, how powerful is it to love your neighbor so much that you will show up even if they're saying things about you so that when we're done with what's happening in the streets, we can then turn to them and say, hey, we were together right there. Can we talk right now? You know, and this has played out a little bit with the athletes who just spoke up, the Philadelphia uh, football player who um, had some quotes, I think there were Hitler quotes or about Hitler, some quotes that were offensive to the Jewish community. I'll say that. I'm not really understanding. I don't really know the quote he used, but I know the story a little bit. And then you had a player from the New England Patriots, a Jewish player named Edelman, who then responded with what I think is one of the most brilliant responses. He wrote a tweet to this player and said, hey, why don't I take you, why don't you come with me to the Holocaust Museum in DC and then I will go with you to the African American Museum across the mall, and then let's have lunch and have the difficult conversation. I think oftentimes we as a community stop that after, let me take you to the Holocaust Museum, and don't realize we are woefully not connected to other people's stories, and we wonder why they don't know our story. We must know other community stories so that we can be there in allyship, to them so that we can then expect them to be with us. The other piece is this. Um, the other piece is this about the Black Lives Matter being not, not pro-Zionism. I don't know any Jew who's 100% pro-Zionism. That means you've got to take in a lot of different strains of Zionism because there is not one monolithic view of Zionism. In fact, Yigal Amir, who assassinated Yitzhak Rabin, was a Zionist. I don't subscribe to his view of Zionism, right? Our Baruch Goldstein, who killed 29 Palestinians in 1994, has an, an ideology of Zionism. It's not mine. So, you know, I, I would say sometimes I am not completely Zionistic in all strains of Zionism there. I have two, three more points, and then we will, um, then I'll open it up. Please, this will be great. Um, our version of the golden rule comes from the Torah of love your neighbor as yourself, right? And then the line goes to take care. They mentioned to take care of the orphan, take care of the widow, take care of the sick. And rabbis will talk about the fact that there are no superfluous words in the Torah. Every word is there for a reason. So you'd ask the question, love your neighbor. That should, that includes sick, orphaned poor, whatever, amongst you. And some of the commentary is, yes, but some of us are more vulnerable than others at certain points in our life. And we need to make sure that we are taking care of them at those times. And so right now, perhaps I'm going to put out there, the black community is vul more vulnerable than us. Yes, we have oppression. Yes, we survived the Holocaust. I want to put this out there. It is time to hold the Holocaust card a little closer than throwing it out all the time. It is, this is not as one of my friends, the woman in Selma who meets with my group says, it's not an oppression Olympics. We are not out competing ourselves for oppression. Of course, I know y'all survived the Holocaust. Y'all made it through there and nobody should go through that. But right now we're talking about the black community. It doesn't hear well for people who are hurting right now to be like, Oh, we're hurt. we've hurt too. Yes, we know that. But let's be of service to that community. Last two things. 
So how did, how did the Black Lives Matter get connected to the Palestinians? You got to go back to Ferguson, St. Louis, and a few years ago. And that on the news, you saw people in the streets of St. Louis being tear gassed. And the Palestinians saw this on the internet and on news, and they ended up uh, texting with the people on the streets in Ferguson saying, we see you being tear gassed. This is how you deal with it, because we deal with tear gas. The Jewish community in St. Louis, all but one synagogue, and, and this there was a reformed synagogue in downtown St. Louis that actually opened its doors and took in people in the streets and served as a rest place and a food station. But many of the Jewish communities in St. Louis retreated back to their homes and left a gap there. So, you know, nobody likes a vacuum. Uh, you know, it's going to get filled. And this, it was not filled by us. So if we want our story told in the way we want to tell it, we have to show up there. And I want to end with this. This is a new idea I've been playing with. But I mentioned Congressman John Lewis. He was my congressman. I am one of the few Americans who was always happy to vote for my congressman. Um, and when people would talk about the fact that you need to um, write to your Congress elected officials, I knew I never had to write to John Lewis. He was going to do things the way I wanted him to do them. Uh, we agreed on a lot of things. The Atlanta Jewish community and the American Jewish community mostly loved John Lewis. You never saw an outpouring of love like you did the week after of his death here in Atlanta from the Jewish community. He had an incredibly close relationship to the black community, I mean, to the Jewish community. And I think that is because we loved him so much because he didn't challenge us. He was very easy to love. I don't think the young black leadership now in the future is going to be so easy on us. I think they're going to have expectations of us as a community and demands of us as a community, probably as they should. We have it of the black community. You know, and many of you were around to remember Jesse Jackson's Jaime Town comments and other people's comments where we had expectations of them to fight that within their community. We have to do it within our community. And I want to end with this quote by Dr. King. He gave this quote um, uh, a year before his death at Cornell University. And he said, people hate each other because they fear each other. And they fear each other because they don't know each other. And they don't know each other because they can't communicate with each other. And they can't communicate with each other because they're separated from each other. As we come up to our Jewish New Year, and as hopefully we are coming to a new year, and I'm not getting political in America, I'm talking about the post-pandemic more, a uh, new way in America, that actually the pandemic does separate us, but may this new Jewish year and when we come out of the pandemic, be the year where we stop being separated from each other and realize we are all tied together in this world and create what John Lewis and King, Dr. King spoke about of this beloved community together. So with that, I am more than happy to take questions or just hear how brilliant everything was. But let's see here. Um, yep. I was, maybe, I was going to say you can see them yourself, but we do have two questions. One was from Mark. Are you familiar with Jonathan Kaufman's book, Broken Alliance, and his argument that Jewish involvement in the civil rights movement led to tension and perhaps animosity sure. between Blacks and Jews? And thank you for that, Mark. So, Mark, I am not... Okay, there you are, Mark. Um, I see you. So, I am not totally familiar with that book, but I can imagine that this may be part of the argument, is it borders on white um, savior ship in that we come in and the power dynamic is like we come in and are saving these people here and i've i've heard many ideas but please let me know if this is not what he was addressing but we never leveled the playing field we just came in and and saved so you know i tell people when we are in selma when you cross the ebon pettus bridge you will you come to a mural and there are faces of people who were killed in selma related to this. Four of them are white, uh, and you have Jimmy Lee Jackson. And one of them is um, Viola Gregg Luzo, a white woman from Detroit, who was murdered driving some of the marchers back and forth. She saw the footage 
of the beatings on the bridge and left her family of five in Detroit and drove down to Selma. And her job was to drive the marchers back and forth. Um, because if you march from Mo Selma to Montgomery, your car was back in Selma. The Klan pulled up alongside her and shot her dead in her car. But one of the stories about Viola Greg Luzo is, is uh, a story of all the white people who came down to Selma. There are no hotels in Selma. Now there's one or two. But back then, they just decided they were going to camp out in front of Brown's Chapel Church. In their white skin, they figured they were going to be safe. What the local black community understood was that they would be dead in the morning. The Klan would have come around and killed them. So the black parents at sundown would do what they call, they would send their kids out to do what they called collecting white people. They would go get those people and bring them back to their homes so they could live to fight another day. James Reeb, the story I told you, he didn't know that you're supposed to take the long way. That's a long way, Mark, to, to say the bigger point, which is this. When we go to be a, to go to work with other communities. And I think we're going with the best of intentions. And I'd like to think that most people showed up in the civil rights struggle with the best of intentions. That we truly be of service to the community we're trying to help instead of telling them how to do things. Instead of coming with our Princeton mentality, our Atlanta mentality and telling you, you know what you need to do? Why don't we show up and say, what do you need from us? And so actually we're gonna see this play out now. America wants to change the name of the Edmund Pettus Bridge, Edmund Pettus, which the bloody Sunday March happened on. Edmund Pettus was a war hero, meaning civil war hero, a statesman, and a leader of the Ku Klux Klan. It's a common story down here. And the locals, I mean, America is like, well, John, name it the John Lewis Bridge. Nobody is asking the black community in Selma what they want. They don't want to change the name of the bridge for a few reasons. One is the main one, which they might not say all the time. And that is, there is nothing economically happening in Selma. It is a destroyed town. Industry is not coming there because there's no, they don't feel there's an educated workforce. There's not an educated workforce because industry isn't coming there. So their number one thing of business is tourism. And they're afraid if you change the name, people aren't going to come for it. Number two, they say be very careful about sanitizing your history because you might forget to talk about these things. Now, that goes in conflict with the move to get rid of uh, Confederate monuments, but their claim is to not change the name, not sanitize. The third thing is this. They're like, why aren't you talking? Why don't we have power over our own thing here? Why is America, who has nothing to do with the Edmund Pettus Bridge, telling us what to do? So I think, you know, uh, Mark, I think that's all part of it, is you come in, and I think, Mark, you hit upon a point that I think we would be wise to understand. And that is, I think, my contention is, American Jewish people only see American Jews as a marginalized group. I don't think many other marginalized groups see us as powerless and marginalized. I think most marginalized groups see us with disproportionate power to our numbers in this country. And by the way, I want to say that's a good thing. I mean, we make up less than 2% of this country, and yet we are so represented in, in government, in business, in finance, so that there is not going to really be a sane politician who says something against the Jewish community here. And that's a lot of power. And I wish, my wish is that we would become comfortable in our power, so much so that we would be fine coming in instead of coming in like this to help them come in and say, how can we help everybody to rise up? You know, how can we be can a I, certain? I'd like to add to that point too. Sure. I think understanding, I think it's, also important to understand i think we've talked about some of these things today and thank you so much for this um but you know, our complicity in in maintaining a structure of uh, the power structure that exists and I, i've shared a couple of i've, sh I've shared a couple of things in the chat there's many more um and i know that you were going to point us to them in a couple of minutes um but i mean there there's there's i think it's important as we think about how we can um how what our what our role is in 
uh, addressing a power structure that systemically disadvantages black people, understanding the role that we have played as individuals, as white individuals and as Jewish, white appearing Jewish individuals in maintaining that power structure, not just currently, but historically as well. Um, I think there was one other question. Oh, did you want to- Yeah, I'm going to get to the two questions. I just want to add on to your statement for a second. And that is why, look, if you're doing the reading now of, of things, the two phrases are, it's not enough to be against racist, racism, you have to be an anti-racist, right? And so um, I'm going to, uh, blanking on his name, K Kendry Abraham's book of how to be an anti-racist is, is at the top of the list. I want to take it a next step, which is the real thing to talk about. And, and Carly, I think you're so right. But part of the problem is I think good intention people don't even realize that it's baked into the system, which is to take care of systemic racism that people who are fighting the fight and the good fight from the white side and the white Jewish side don't even understand how baked we, we might not even understand some of the things that we've just bought as the way society works. So you got to delve deep and it takes, it's a lot of examining. And so I like to give people the benefit of the doubt. I think we're coming in with the best of intentions, but I think we should be very conscious of that. But we do have other questions here. Okay. The Camilla, uh, I, I learned it's Kamala, Kamala Harris. I was saying it five different ways. Um, where'd that question go to? Okay, here we go. Lori and Rich, right? Okay, there y'all are. Some people have disparaged Camilla, uh, Kamala Harris's self-described racist saying she's not African-American. Okay, so it's funny you say this because I just got off of a, uh, a talk with uh, friends of mine that I don't necessarily see eye to eye on politically. Uh, we won't be at the same party on November 3rd, uh, literally and figuratively, I guess you could say, uh, election party here. And so they were making fun of saying, well, what is she? Is she, an in I mean, they were using the improper terms, I think, to get at me. Is she Indian? Is she Caribbean? Is she Black? Which one is she going to run as today? And I said, I don't know. Which one do you dislike more? I was like, that's you. That's not her problem. That's you. Because she's all of them. She goes, they're like, but which one are you going to call her as? I'm like, I'm calling her as a strong American leader. I was like, that's my phrase for her. So, and I realize I've just become, I've just given away my political stance. Not that you probably didn't pick up on it, but um, I was just like, that's, that's on them. So, you know, somebody's going to that length, they're needing to get this fear out. And my question, underlying question uh, is always, and it's the same question during the civil rights movement. What are you so afraid of? What is going to happen? And getting people to understand that, you know, equality is not pizza. There's enough for everybody. My slice doesn't get lessened because somebody else gets a slice of that. Um, I do have discussions, by the way, with my far left. I have a niece um who gets very frustrated with me because I'm not radical enough for her. She's just graduated uh, college and uh, as, as only somebody her age can be, um, radical and, and, and frustrated and, and fighting the fight. And she's told me as a white cisgender male, um, I need to get up from the table and let other voices at the table. And I said, why do you think there's limited seats at the table? Why don't we have a bigger table? so that everybody can sit down here and talk. And yes, listen to other voices. But I, I'm just, I'm not willing, look, you know, I, I, I find myself cornered by the left and the right because I am a white male with privilege and I'm not giving up any of that. And I wasn't, I didn't choose that either. Just like nobody chose to be born into parts of, you know, in Newark the kids born in the rough sides of Newark that you won't go to. They didn't choose that either. And yet America does place values on our lives. Interestingly enough. Um, I think we, we had one other question. I think yeah. we should address before we wrap up. It was, um, Lisa. although I would just add, that I, 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 before we get to Lisa's question, I would just respond to, to that by saying that if, it, we can't, they're not, it's not always possible to expand the table. And we do I have, to, I agree with your niece. We yeah. do have to be comfortable giving up some of those of us who have power do have to be comfortable sharing what we've got because otherwise nothing's going to change. So right. uh, sharing Lisa's is question, good. And yep. what is your, what is your opinion of how we should react to current anti-Semitic events? 
Yeah. yeah. My son was told to quote read the room when he showed anger and disgust at the lack of support when swastikas were found recently in the midst of current protests. Okay. So Lisa, um, my response, and I'm not sure if this is going to be um, totally accepted or not. A, I mean, we are in a current of tremendous hate. Hate people who are hating are finding um, are emboldened in our country right now to to share it. Um, I am hoping. I'm a fan of the comedian Mark Marin, who I saw in concert once, and he said you know, and he's left, he is far to the left. He said, I find myself having to say to too many people, hey, you know, it's not right. It's not okay to say that still. We still don't say that here. So um, I think your son needs to speak his truth, his, his power. And so if he feels the need to speak up, he should never have to read the room. It's his opinion. You know what? I, I don't quite, I mean, I understand what that statement means. I don't understand the application to your son. If he is frustrated or angry by this, he should speak up. What I will say is this, and it goes back to once again, feeling comfortable with our power in that I will, I am a little more, I'm like, okay, that did have the swastikas did happen or that hate speech happened there against Jews. Um, you know what? You're making me rethinking that I want to say this. I would like there to be people there for me. And therefore I need to be there when it doesn't say just about Jews. And I'm not saying anything about your son or anything like that. I'm just saying that our community does show up when it's about us. And once again, I think we would do a lot of service of cutting out anti-Semitism, being proactive against anti-Semitism by being there when other people are, and standing up is just saying hate of any form is wrong. That is, was the response. Yeah. Yeah. So I agree with all that. Um, in yeah. closing, Billy, are there resources we are, as, as we've talked about offline, New York, our congregation is um, at the beginning of our exploration of um, how we can be anti-racist, not as individuals, as a Jewish community, as a Jewish community in New Jersey, what mm -hmm. that means for us as individuals and as Jews, and, and how we can actualize our intentions in the best possible way. Um, what resources do you have to share that for us as we continue our, our, our journey here? Thank you for asking that question. And um, I want to say this, in that, look, Princeton, New Jersey, y'all know the New York Times bestseller list. You can look at that list, and there's all your resources right there. I want to throw you a curveball here, which is to say every once in a while, stop reading and go outside and live the book you're reading. It is way too simple to just say, I've read, you know, white fragility. I have read how to be an anti-racist. I, I have read to be how this, that's all fine and good. But like we have not seven Ishma, you know, learn all about it. And um, there are books, and you, by the way, Carly, are the reference. You don't need me. The, all those references are, are great, and I'm sure you've got many more. The thing I want to push us on is the now that you've learned, go do as well. And so I want to I leave this story with you, um, and, and I'll share it with the rabbi. I'll send her a copy of this, but um, right after the George Floyd murder, and that weekend when we saw cities erupt, Atlanta erupted. And that Sunday, I was just sitting at home feeling so powerless. I mean, I, I run a business that is all about being out doing this stuff. And because of the virus and all, I've been on the sidelines for five months. I told somebody the other day, I feel like my car broke down the side of the road. And I'm just standing there watching all of this go by when this is exactly the work we're doing on the road with these things. It's, it's incredibly frustrating. That's why I appreciate being able to talk with y'all tonight. Um, but I want, I went down to where I get a lot of inspiration and comfort. I went down to the King center where the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King are buried. And I was just sitting there and a black gentleman came by and um, just sat down and it being a um, Southern city, we acknowledged each other. 
And then he just said to me, he goes, so did the news bring you down here? And I said, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm here. I don't live far, but yeah. And he goes, how are you doing? And I just looked at him. I was like, not good. How are you? And he's like, I, I'm scared. I am angry. I am frustrated. I don't know what to tell my cousins and nephews and nieces and my children. And we sat in silence for a little bit. And I just looked at him and said, I, I'm so sorry. And he goes, you didn't do anything. What are, you, what are you sorry about? I was like, I don't know. I'm sorry that we live in a country where you and I are having to talk to each other like this right now. And we just sat there. He goes, do you think it's going to get better? And I said, I, I don't know. I don't. For the first time, I'm not so optimistic. This was back then. I'm much more optimistic now. I said, I don't, I, I don't know. And he looked at me and he just nodded. And then he goes, well, maybe this is how we're going to get better. I said, I really think so too. I hope so. And then we sat there together in silence. And then we were like, okay, it was great to meet you. And it being the South too, when we got up, he said, can I pray for us? I was like, sure. So he prayed with me right there. And I got to say, it was one of the most holiest moments um, I ever had it was right there next to Dr. King's tomb. And I just want to say that I think we think it's going to be big programming and important programming. When I do want to say that sometimes it's just talking to people who don't look like you, who don't think like you, who don't pray like you, who don't vote like you, who don't love like you, that's going to make the change. And it doesn't have to be something that solves a problem. It's just making a connection. Because once you see yourself in somebody else, how much harm can you do once you can see the humanity in somebody else? So that's a way of saying, do the work, read the books, have the discussions, have the actions, have the programs. But I do want to say, not just a Martin Luther King Day program, please. Don't, this isn't Yom Kippur. It's not just once a year. I was like, the point of Yom Kippur is 300, the other 364 days of the year or however many are in the Jewish calendar. But uh, it's, it's the rest of the year too. So it's going to be continued small dialogue that people's names aren't going to be sponsoring, that people aren't going to be, you know, that you can't win awards for. It's going to be talking to the person that is making you a little bit angry um, and just showing compassion and humanity to, to each other. And by the way, it helps us too. It helps you as well when doing that. So, um, you know, I, I got to say, when we first talked, I said I would have more resources for you. And I've been thinking a lot lately that we know how to get those. The main resource I just want to give us is the permission to just walk out and talk when we don't know what to say. And to act in ways that are uncomfortable in addition to talking, right? We need to act and think about what we're willing to sacrifice, including our comfort. Um, and no Adina, change comes from comfort. That's right. Um, Adina, will you uh, lead us out? So to bring us to a close, I want to end with some words of prayer. God of justice, in your wisdom, you create all people in your image, B'Tselem Elohim, without exception. Through your goodness, open our eyes to see the dignity, beauty, and worth of every human being. Open our minds to understand that all your children are brothers and sisters in the same human family. Open our hearts to repent of racist attitudes, behaviors, and speech which demean others. Open our ears to hear the cries of those wounded by racial discrimination and their passionate appeals for change. Strengthen our resolve to make amends for past injustices and to right the wrongs of history. And fill us with courage that we might seek to heal wounds, build bridges, forgive and be forgiven, and establish peace and equality for all in our communities. Mm. And together we say, Amen. 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 Can Thank I just make so much, one more? Can I make one more thing? I'm so bad at this, but a shameless plug here. And that is, we have started an online lecture series, 
And the one at the end of the month is about systemic racism on August 30th. If you go to the top of the comments, you'll go to my website. And the, the series is called Mind Trips. And it's a monthly series where we just had one about a gentleman who, a black blues musician who befriended Klansmen. And he talks about having the uncomfortable conversations to get them to leave the Klan. Uh, on the 30th, Sunday night, the 30th, we are speaking with a woman who's doing a little workshop with us about systemic racism and how we can see systemic racism. Uh, in September, we're, we're talking to the woman who was 11 years old when she was beaten on the bridge in Selma, Alabama, working for voting rights. And then we're going to end by meeting and talking with Fair Fight 2020, Stacey Abrams' group, about the fight for voters' rights now and voting equality now. In October, we're going to meet with Evan Wolfson, who was a um, lawyer, who is a lawyer, uh, who fought the fight for marriage equality by taking on the task of changing the hearts and minds of America. And um, he knew that the Supreme Court would never make this change um, if we didn't uh, change the hearts and minds. And then on um, November 15th, we're going to have a post-election wrap-up with somebody from the left, Ruth Messenger from the left, and we're working on, we had Senator Jeff Flake on the right, but he's not now going to be in the country, he just found out. So um, uh, we'll have somebody from the right to do a post-election uh, analysis. You can sign up on our website. I would love to have some of you there if you want more of this, but I just need to put the shameless plug in there. But, but thank you all. But before that, Billy... We're yeah. looking forward to seeing you again in yes, two I cannot wait. same time um, about how to have difficult conversations. And before that, a week from today, next Thursday, Adria, if you could just wave at everyone, Adria Sherman is leading a virtual museum tour of African-American artists. And that's at oh, wow. 30. So in a week from today, 1.30 p.m. on a different Zoom link, go to the website. And a week from that at 7.30 p.m., we will hear from Billy again. Yeah. And again, check the website as it's a different link as tonight. Thank you all so much. And thank you for doing this, putting this all together. So, and thank you, Carly, for all your help and guidance and leadership. All right. Have a good night. We'll see you 